It'll well, be a tough one. Good afternoon, everyone. Rich Swarbinski with the Mortgage Collaborative here once again with the last week in mortgage today, where we take you through the week that was in the mortgage industry. Uh, each week, uh, I select one of our lender members to be my co-host. And this week, back in the co-pilot seat, the president and CEO of American Mortgage Service Corp, based out of Cincinnati, Ohio, Bill Case. Bill, good to see you. Good to see you too, Rich. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Spend a few minutes this afternoon. And uh, we've had better times in the business, but it's always good to meet and talk no matter what's going on. Yeah, it's, I, you know, this show, it's, I hate, I'm such a glass half full person in general, you know, so this, this, the weekly half hour last week in mortgage show, and it's been challenging to try to put a positive spin on things as of late, but uh, they're there. You just gotta, you gotta dig a little deeper. Well, we've been through them. I mean, you know, uh, unless it's an audio version, uh, people would be able to see, okay, I'm not somebody that just jumped into this business uh, by the hair and receding hairline. They're going to know that I've been in this a few years. So 38 years, I think now, and you know, you've seen the best and the worst. And, and at times it's like you get through, you know, you, you had two years or a year and three quarters of unbelievably spectacular business, overwhelming business. Well, of course there's going to be then, uh, you know, the curve's going to, or the, the hill is, you're going to raise the top of the hill and you're going to start downhill. And then we are now, and, but there's still business out there. And I always say it's the the good companies stick around, they figure it out, the wildflowers in the desert that grow when the rains come in usually fade and go away and that's okay too. You know, they help with taking business uh, that's there when we can't handle it either and then it slows down and people settle back in a little bit. But it's, you know, it can be tough on individuals and people and, you know, where there's layoffs, but, uh, you know, the industry still moves on. Very well said from a guy, you know, not to date you, but uh, that's that okay. a leader uh, in our industry for a long time, seen a lot of different cycles. It's interesting. We talked about this on this show, the perspective of leaders that are maybe younger and newer, eight, 10 years in the industry, uh, those like yourself that have spent a little longer than that. And it's like, you know, yeah, hey, been here, done that. There's some advantages and some opportunities in a cycle like this. And we'll come out the other end, but to your broader point, like what, what goes up must come down, right? Two years of record low rates, two years of record volume and refis, uh, you know, the, the other shoes got to drop at some point and here we are. Yep. You just have to prepare yourself. You try to, you know, the high, don't the highs, you don't want them to be too high mentally and for your people too high and the lows not to be too low. You can get through it and, you know, businesses uh, survive and find ways that typically the good ones do. Another just great piece of general advice, right? Avoid the the, the crazy highs and lows just uh, in general in life. See so many people uh, just in all of our lives, I'm sure on other ends of those spectrums, it, uh, advice would probably behoove them. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, it's not even just, I remember saying that for years, and it's not even just about, say, your business or anything else, but uh, you're likely, you're never as good as you think you are, and you're never as bad as you think you are, so... <laughs> Well said. So let's go ahead and get into it. And as always, any sure. comments, questions, thoughts anybody has for Bill or I, uh, go ahead and incorporate them into the chat or Q&A and uh, we'll voice them aloud. And Bill also with another good plug there for the audio only listeners. Our biggest audience is the podcast audience. So I usually mention at the end, but those of you listening on podcast, uh, join the live version. We're here live on Zoom every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. So, and you can go to mortgagecollaborative.com, go to our member event calendar and register. One time you're registered for all, all the live episodes. So, but let's go ahead and get into it. And Bill, let's start with just, I guess, the general business climate. Um, this year has been kind of crazy, unexpected in that, how quickly rates have gone up and home values have continued to go up. Um, really kind of choking off refi into, you know, a lesser degree purchase business and you kind of look at this year so far we've had this steady incline in rates and then you know this last month here really in june um the market kind of shifted from okay fed's going to raise probably 50 at their next two meetings to we get a worse than expected inflation number in early june the fed starts to up their rhetoric we get 75 basis points instead of 50 they say they're going to raise another 75 the collective markets the fixed income markets which are feed off inflation because they eat away at the fixed nature of those assets, kind of losing their confidence in the Fed a little bit. So 30 year fixed rates spike up even higher. And here we are, we're somewhere in the sixes right now, right? On, on pretty much even the best credit 30 year fixed. Correct. I think the, the rates, you know, we've somewhat been talking about that for two years. I mean, after 20, we thought 
21, well, rates are going to come, they're going to go be going up again. And there were predictions last year to be, well, it'll be up to the fours and fives and then didn't really happen. And then happened more this year, obviously, and spiked up. But in my opinion, I, the, the interest rates still are not really the issue. And I get, again, from a historical factor, they're still at lower than than most of history if you take all the combined years for the last let's just go back the last you know 40 years or so uh rates are still pretty good people were buying i, I looked at something last evening uh you know sometimes you refresh your memory and i i still uh, remember back in 9091 uh where we said well if fixed rates can get down to 10 percent from the 11 11 and a half we thought well this will be a really good time for the market huge refi boom occurred at 9%. So it is perspective. I think that the still the single biggest issues are lack of uh, uh, housing availability, which to me it also leads into the second, which say is the affordability of housing. But I believe the lack of housing is just number one, because we've dealt with rates. The industry has dealt with rates in this category many, many, many times. What you've not dealt with is this level of affordability, lack of affordability. Uh, that's the biggest headwind, and that just can't be solved quickly. You know, you could drop rates uh, right away, and even when rates were lower earlier in this year, you still weren't, you know, the business, we were not blowing up. I mean, the refi market was uh, waning anyway, uh, but the, the lack of inventory is just the single biggest cause, and I'm not sure that's going to change a lot until... You know, the, the best estimates are maybe mid next year, but uh, I think, you know, rates are going to be where they are for a bit, uh, but it's affordability that's just, that's what's, uh, and the lack of housing that's killing people. It's a great perspective. I was looking at like one of those historical 30 year fixed rate charts of like the last 50 years. And it does, it, I, I would encourage everybody to do that just because it does paint the picture that Bill just painted. If you look at interest rates at the history of time, six and a quarter, whatever it is today, feels horrible. Um, but historically, it's still a very low rate. Um, interest rates are controlled by, are so hard to predict, obviously. Economists have been wrong on them for decades now and um, in our industry with mortgage rates. And you know, we're seeing right now inflation's impact on mortgage rates, a war uh, overseas, uh, you know, so many different things can impact interest rates as to uh, less out of our control or harder to predict. Home value is really a byproduct largely of supply and demand. You mentioned just an ongoing dearth of supply and you know, you read a lot of stories now because it's it's the clickbait. It's what's going to get the headlines. Oh, stock market crashing, housing market's next, or here comes the housing crash. Like, I don't see that at all. Every home that goes out there in the market is still getting gobbled up. And I think that there is a strong underlying demand for housing, for housing market and housing prices to crash. People got to stop buying homes and values haven't even come down. There's not enough of them out there, but they keep getting bought. Um, I don't know. I just I, I think that we're going to see values hold up and demand stay strong. And but to your point, there's impediments to the supply side that are restricting that demand. I agree. I, I think you're not going to see the conditions. You know, there's no absolutes and no somebody say one thousand percent. This is the way something's going to happen. But, you know, when you think of last times when there has been bubbles in housing late uh, 90s, obviously in the 06 to 09 area uh, with a financial crisis. But you had, this is the strongest book of business ever. I think you had one of the notes that you had sent over to me. You know, we talk about the mortgage delinquency being at uh, uh, lows in the last few years and some of them historic lows. The book of business out there is incredibly strong. And, and I read something recently about uh, they said, well, yeah, but if rates, but if uh, values uh, go down on housing, uh, you know, people aren't going to make their payments. That's a bunch of crap. I mean, you get if people that have very high credit scores are not going to be walking away from houses because they think the values less uh, than they bought it. And I also feel like that is not going to be the biggest part of the housing group. There, there are people, I think the people most at risk in the near term that have houses are if you have purchased in the last couple of years and you are compelled to move or really just want to move uh, in the next two to three or four years, you could see where maybe I don't get everything I put into it. Um, I Would housing prices be a little less? Very possible, or very possible. I don't, I don't see a crash. I don't think anybody does because just as you said, there's too much demand. I mean, even the people talking about 
well, we could see foreclosures tick up when the rules, uh, some of the protections come off. The market could use some foreclosures. Uh, some of those houses available would help people. So I, don't, I think the people in the near term, and, and, and I have people, I've, I've had uh, one of my uh, kids buy a house uh, in the last six months. And, and that was something I told her is that as long as this is a house that you foreseeably see yourself in for years easily that you won't have to move, I said, then you do it because you want the house. If you think you're doing something for a year or two, those people I caution because you could be impacted there. You could be impacted. I remember back in the, uh, we were up in New York at the time, um, back in the early 90s. Um, as a matter of fact, we were going to sell one house and we're moving. You could get new construction cheaper than you could get existing housing. Like people were, were finding out that, well, I put my house on the market, I could, somebody else could build one for less. And that went on for a while. I could see that happening within two to four years if prices on, I mean, lumber is already down. It's still awful, but it's down half from what it was, I think, in March. If you see materials and prices come down because inflation does get more in check, is it possible that new construction costs could be a little better? It actually would help the market. It wouldn't help those that are necessarily looking to sell that bought at the peak of the market. But I think the, the biggest issue with our with the demand that would be solved is the people that have been in their houses for a while that are sitting on enormous amounts of equity that if there were available, more available housing, those people would move. And that's really what's going to drive the market, I think. And that's what we have to have happen in the next year or two. And I think you've had this, uh, what's the old term, the Pygmalion effect, right, uh, where self uh, a prophecy just uh, comes true because we all think it is. You know, nobody wants to move because, well, I can't find a house. Well, then I can't move if I can't find a house. Well, that's just holding the whole market back. So I think there's a lot of people that will have a lot of equity and whether or not they say, well, my house, well, in 2021, this would have been worth 450. Well, then maybe now it's going to be worth 400. Uh, you can sell it easily at 400 in a couple of years and your mortgage is still 200 or 150 because you bought it a few years ago those people will be in a position to move and easily can and have that equity. So we just, there has to be almost more of an impetus to get those people out of those houses uh, uh, and they're out there. Um, uh, but that's the biggest, and I think that's just gonna be, it's just gonna take some time to get some confidence. This is the last week in mortgage today. I'm Rich Swarbinski with the Mortgage Collaborative. This week joined by American Mortgage Service Co's President and CEO, Bill Case. And yeah, Bill, think about it. We got right now, record amounts of equity that homeowners have in homes and record low delinquency. That's nothing to sneeze at to have those two things happen at the same time. You couple that with a labor market that still is incredibly strong, very low unemployment and what we both believe to be a very strong kind of shadow, not showing up in any of the stats yet, demand from people to still buy houses that aren't. And I, I look, I read these columns of, you know, and again, it's clickbait, but it's some reputable news organizations. Oh, housing crash, here it comes, bubble. It, it just, it, it cracks me up because I, I would ask anybody that writes a piece like that to record low delinquency, record high equity, strong demand. I mean, it, I, I think we're, the purchase side of our business right now, temporarily, you know, has got some, I think people just have some sticker shock, right, on rates and values. But I honestly, especially you see the, the Fed get inflation in check. They're working hard to do it. You see 30-year fixed rates come back into the fours. You see, and we're starting to see it now. I just read a column earlier today, um, listing price reductions, big shock. It's happening at a higher percentage in these the higher priced homes. And this, the Miamis, the Phoenixes, the Salt Lakes, these cities that have been exploding. So you start to see the correction at the top end. The second that can seep back down a little bit more into mainstream housing, those step up buyers, great point. The people that have the ability to buy the next home that aren't right now, it's almost like we need that cycle that, that will trigger off, then their home's available. Then you got the person in the $300,000 home that's going into the four because it's available and it will start to open things up. I mean, that's uh, the way I see it playing out. And it sounds like you're kind of aligned. I agree. I, I, it's, it's not, I mean, you, 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 when you talk about clickbait and that really is, I mean, you read uh, just like, and I read a lot of financial articles and the one, well, here, this crash is coming or that crash is coming. It's like, well, all things are possible, but uh, the, the conditions are just not there in our markets. Uh, there are still, I mean, you know, as I've said to people over the last few months, 
Well, there's less buyers now. Okay, so instead of 15 people bidding on a house, there's five or six. Okay, there's still multiple bids. I mean, I'm just making those numbers up, but there's still multiple bids for every house. So you're, you're not seeing houses that are, okay, where things are just sitting. And, and what was the latest? We got a two and a half month supply where, if that even, uh, where we're four to six months is typical. So that's just going to take time and uh, to work its way out. And, and I, I do believe, you know, I don't, when you have conditions as we have, we've been talking about where you have people with a ton of equity and a people with, with low delinquencies, uh, the market is not going to be in any danger, um, you know, of oh, the, the housing market. I think you, you, you don't see the growth as much as you like, which can help the broader markets, but uh, it's not, you know, you're not going to see a crash. There's, there's a, anybody that's writing mostly that I think is somewhat reputable uh, is not predicting that at all. And then I would say, you know, when you, when you mentioned, well, people that, you know, you'd say, well, there could be names of people that write things. I mean, it's kind of a reminder. Uh, I mean, I even said this two years ago. Uh, I, I'm not the only one. There are others in our business. But uh, when uh, we had a number of uh, companies in our business go public, Mm -hmm. And you're reading the same things and anybody that's listening is reading the same things. Um, and I remember at the time saying, oh my gosh, like if somebody said, will you buy into a mortgage entity in 2020? Uh, yeah, if I'm selling out within six or eight months, but if I'm buying that for the long term um, and you feel like, well, who would do that? And investors, they, they had great IPOs and offerings. In a couple of cases, the, the numbers came down. But they sold stock at huge, at, at very large levels, and now look what you're reading. The uh, I think Rob Christmas column today, right? The another one that he quoted doesn't matter who, but uh, you know your your million dollar investment. We were seventy five thousand dollars. So I look at things like that and say, okay, well these are right. Those are experts, right? Those are investor experts that that know what they're doing. It's like, well, they don't really. So I think you you know you tend to have to probably find people more cl closer to the industry that have seen things and. And not just somebody who says, okay, I know what, yeah, I'm jumping on the next bandwagon because that to me is a stark reminder. It's like, I don't know how many, somebody asked me two years ago and said, what do you think of investment? I said, if you're going to get in and get out quickly, but I, you can't buy, right? You're buying at the absolute peak of the market. So yeah. we're not all as smart as we think sometimes. Crazy. It really is. It's the Rocket Mortgage, very multifaceted organization. It certainly is not like hinged the refi business, at least to the extent that they once were. At one point in the 30s, now in the 70s. So, uh, and, and, you know, they're number one mortgage lender in America, multi channel. They, they would seem to address some of the investor concerns with mortgage. But uh, yeah, to your point, uh, timing is everything. That's why we see now why all those mortgage companies went public, uh, you know, all around the same time. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, I, you know, that was my answer when it came up somewhere. I was on a group call and somebody just said, what do you think, what do you think about those companies that are going IPO? And I said, I think it's fantastic for the current owners. Uh, absolutely. And the underwriter probably uh, was going to make a good amount of money on that. But I said, uh, the individual investors, boy, that's uh and it's funny because you think about we have had discussions with people that, you know, have been in the business a, a, a few years at least. Uh, and, you, you know, we all come and say the same thing is like, God, what somebody should have asked, uh, researched a little better about, you know, what do you think about this investment? But it really is. It's just jumping on. You see it in the stock markets, uh, you know, people jumping on what they think is the next greatest thing or something. And. You know, you're sitting back thinking, God, guys, why don't you just dig, dig a hole in your backyard, put their money, put your money in there, and then come back in two years, you're going to find you did better. <laughs> uh, Bill, government involved in our industry to an extent that we haven't seen since, you know, the years following the meltdown. Uh, in a different way, though, I, I, you know, I think through this presidential administration, FHFA, through Fannie and Freddie, we saw some of the stuff they're, they're trying to do with the housing supply plan and uh, certainly low to moderate income borrowers, borrowers of color, things they're trying to do to help narrow the racial home ownership gap. You got CFPB that's been a much different tune, obviously. Um, you know, this last year, um, uh, servicing uh, uh, metric guidelines and fair lending and came out recently said they were going to take another look at the QM rule. Always just curious to get the perspective of our great leaders at our IMB members, just your perspective on the regulatory climate right now. I tend to look at the regulatory climate as 
nothing compares to 09, 10, 11, when you feel, felt like you were blindfolded, walking in the dark, and there's furniture all over the place, and you have no shoes on. And you're just, you have no idea where you're going, what you're trying to accomplish or what try to do. And there's no assistance and guidance or not consistently. I feel like the industry adapted as always um, to lots of things through the middle 2010s and late 2010s. And now you look and say, it's, it's you know, it's, okay, so you're always dealing with something. And, and you look at the previous administration and say, okay, there were... Um, positives in that, okay, well, the CFPB backed away from a few things, um, but then they also uh, put in some people in positions that created more difficulty. Um, you know, we have had discussions, Mark Calabria, when he was in charge of FHFA and was not doing consumers or uh, lenders any favors with some of the policies uh, that they were doing and uh, with Fannie and Freddie. So, so what, I tend to look and say, oh, it's a balancing act. There's already got some less regulation on the one hand out of CFPB and then all of a sudden, but FHFA is, is making it more difficult in some other ways. Now you flip and say, okay, so uh, there were some things that were changed fairly quickly with the new administration uh, from the FHFA level that probably provided a little better stability and took some of the fears of, okay, we're going to, you know, we're getting rid of this and you got, it's going uh, public and we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're raising rates, raising G fees, all this stuff. And then the CFPB, though, swings the pendulum, goes a little bit back the other way that, uh, yeah, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're going to look at some things a little closer. Honestly, I still have not seen anything of a significant concern coming out of me personally, CFPB. I mean, you know, you, uh, friends I talk, we don't service, uh, certainly full disclosure there, but um, I certainly have uh, colleagues that do that. And, and one person that's been doing this for years and has had about a 20, 30 billion dollar book tends to say the same thing. It's like, you know, it's like if you do your job, you do it right, usually OK. And, and I think that applies probably for a lot of things. Um, there have been very few blatantly unfair things done, even when the CFPB was at its, mm -hmm. I don't want to say worst, when it, when it was at its peak of, um, you know, going after people, there were certainly the, you know, the, okay, we didn't, uh, uh, you know, enforcement by, um, what was the term? I'm sorry, I'm losing it. Oh, yeah, like enforcement action. You know, yeah, like, yeah, hey. yeah. In, in, like, oh, we there, were, yeah, there weren't many times though, right. There weren't many times uh, that when you looked at the case, you felt like, wow, that person was really getting slammed. I mean, most of them were like, you either were pushing up against something or you clearly did something wrong. There were clearly a couple of things, but so I tend like in my list of things in the business, we already touched on the ones that I think are critical. The, the critical things are we don't have enough supply and housing and we don't have enough low cost housing for people to get into the market there. The CFPB to me, FHFA even, just not on the radar. I, I, I personally uh, have felt the, the moves in the second home and the non-owner occupied. I've probably been saying for 30 years, I don't know why Fannie and Freddie were ever into that as heavy as they were. I, and, and, and it's okay most of the time, but I think we've made this a more acute problem because clearly uh, some of the single family housing supply is affected by people that have purchase seconds or purchase non occupieds or companies that have purchased. I think it hasn't made it any better. So I, I'm not saying they can't do that, but being able to buy and that's, that shouldn't probably be their primary mission anyway. So I was always one that, okay, if the rates are higher, they're higher, then let them then go to a financial institution. Uh, if it's a commercial, if it's non occupied, that's commercial. And if it's a second home, right, if you want the luxury of a second home, then you maybe have to pay a little more. So those changes to me weren't huge, but I, I tend I'm not, I'm not concerned right now with what I see on the landscape, really. It's still, it's, uh, it's lack of housing and, and affordability. And, you know, I think the, 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 the worst of the CFP, you know, the Cordray era, the focus seemed to really be on RESPA, which is more gray just in its nature. Now it's things that are more measurable. If it's, you know, metric, your Humda stats on who you're approving and not approving loans for. And if you're a servicer, the metrics on what you're doing to help out people that are slow paying or having a hard time paying. So it's much more. Great measurable. point. Great point. So, um, but uh, the, uh, we had our collab labs last week, a lot of IMBs that came out and were, uh, you know, having really in-depth discussions with one another. Not surprisingly, it seems like, you know, it's going through my notes from last week, the, 
the, the main categories of discussion, again, not surprisingly, growth and business development, cost cutting and looking at everything. And then what I would just kind of call like this, the search to differentiate. Um, if it's through product or something unique right now to get the attention of, you know, every realtor in America that's got, you know, eight or nine lenders in there about the one loan they hope they have coming up sometime soon. So um, as, you, as we get into the, the heart of the year, anything in there really top of mind for you and in, in your company uh, right now? I, I would say overall, it's, you know, you, you're looking at expenses, cost cutting, you know, wherever you could. I mean, it's always, everybody would probably say it's always an ongoing, but we clearly were not paying a lot of attention and we being, you know, us along with everybody in the industry in 21, 2020, clearly. Uh, you know, you really weren't worried about cost cutting. If anything, you're just, you're throwing money to try to solve problems because your lack of staffing and everything else. Uh, you were hoping money could solve your problems. So you weren't worried about costs. You know, that still is number one. I think, you know, our loan officers, I mean, I'm still hearing they have buyers, can't find houses. So it's not where, well, gee, I don't know what to do here. Um, you know, it's, it's, they're following kind of the national numbers with there's the sales. Sales are down a little bit. Um, uh, and, you know, it's really not the lack of customer, it's the lack of, uh, uh, you know, of available housing. Products, I, you know, I, it always seems to be, you know, we, whenever business goes down, there's always the talk of, well, you know, like, is there some, what's the next greatest thing? Where's the shiny object coming? And, and I think, again, in a market like this, where you're looking at, okay, there's not a product out there that we can say, all right, here's a mortgage and it comes with a house. You know, we, we have to have the house first. So we can't give the house. Otherwise, that'd be a great product. Um, but ARM products, still not enough for differentiation there. And I think, again, going back to the, the historically with rates, these rates aren't high enough to really be pulling a lot of money out of uh, fixed rate mortgages yet. People aren't seeing that huge difference. I mean, little dribs and drabs. And then, again, other products. I think, uh, and I, I just was uh, with a couple of real estate agents uh, last week. It's not, you know, the buyers that are coming in, it's like, they're not like, oh, gee, you don't have this program. Boy, I got these people that would, this is what they could use to buy a house. It's the same thing. And I know I feel like we're, you know, we keep beating the same drum for the last 20 minutes, but they don't have houses. They're all saying the same thing. We don't have houses. It's not finding buyers to qualify or how do I qualify? It's how do we find houses? We may hit that again in the future somewhere, but maybe not this, this year or next year. Uh, right now, it's all about houses. So, I mean, to put a bow on this, uh, you know, it, it's, we all, we agree, right? It's like, it is a supply issue right now in our industry. But, you know, we had on uh, the show I do with Rob Crisman a couple of Fridays ago, like it was Obama's like top housing policy guy for most of his term. And he just said, listen, there's a huge playbook for if it's politicians or policymakers to go into to help with the demand side of things. If it's uh, first time home buyer credits and tax credits and uh, down payment assistance. He's like, there's not really a playbook to, saw, to help the supply. It's all things that are tough, complex, take time, are nuanced. And, you know, the Biden administration, it's certainly, he also kind of said, like, they've been working on this housing supply thing for a year. Like, they're very focused on ways that they can help it, which is encouraging to hear. But any thoughts? on things that we could do. is it best to just let the regular market dynamics play out is there should there be intervention i don't this is a little more unique than many other times in the business where you know if it's slowdowns it's been you know while well, you know rates that take the rates that were really good that the refis were good for a while and then went away and or you had uh economies many times where you had significant recessions uh, where, you know, no, there's just not enough people to feel comfortable to buy, oversupplies of housing have been out there. All the targeted things that you just mentioned, they're, you know, like down payment assistance. I mean, we have, you know, the state housing programs, virtually every state has those. That multi-thousand dollars is not making a difference for that first time home buyer. They can't afford three, four, five hundred thousand dollar houses. It doesn't matter. And I don't, I feel like that is a waste of resources to put money into that. I tend to look at this and I know I have this, I rely a lot on my old economics degree and background and, and governments clearly get more credit and then they get more blame for business cycles. Business cycles are what they are. And there's not much they can do about this. Uh, we're gonna have, this was gonna, have, no matter what anybody, I mean, after 08, 
uh, right? With the, you know, everybody, well, so many builders left the business and we weren't building enough. And I remember for years talking in front of like realtor groups and saying, you know, we're, new construction is not good. We're, we should be building, you know, 1.5 to 1.75 million a year. We were averaging less than a million or barely over a million. You knew that was going to catch up at some point, but there wasn't much anybody could do. Uh, and now, you know, you've got cost things. It doesn't matter. I mean, let somebody come in and say, okay, we're going to, we're going to subsidize housing. We're going to subsidize the whole process. We're going to pay for materials. That's just economically impossible. You can't, to make a dent in the market. You can, you know, you can help someone buy, uh, I mean, apartment buildings to me are easier things to target than uh, housing. I mean, we just, I think actually something you said sent also was the, you know, the, the difficulty in the rental market right now that you can make an impact on by, you know, going in and repurposing buildings, uh, people taking, you've read a couple of times, taking malls, taking other offices. I think they're doing this in Manhattan. They're taking previous office spaces that people don't need and turn them into housing. You can do that quickly. It creates a lot of units. Single family housing, just, you know, it's local ordinances. People don't, I mean, we live in an area that's pretty rural uh, and they still have, you know, what would really help? Well, maybe you make less than five acres. Well, they're not going to move on that. They're going to say, we want five, we want minimum five acre parcels in this county generally, and we're not going to move off. That's worked for us. And so you're going to have local level issues that are not going to help. You're going to have larger and it's not going to be solved. Uh, not to rain on the parade, but I just feel, not yours, I mean, but just in general, people talk about these, can the government do something? No, they can't. Just like the government can't change the fact that we've had inflation. I mean, People will argue a little bit and say, well, did some of the pandemic money fuel this a little more? Yeah, it's possible. But I think we would have had this anyway. You had incredible pent-up demand that was going to come to life no matter what. Uh, and it, maybe inflation wouldn't have been as bad. Supply chain issues that were clearly caused had nothing to do with pandemic uh, programs of money, totally that were going to ramp up uh, 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 inflation that had nothing to do with money coming from any government. So factors that, you know, if somebody could have predicted, yeah, we're going to have a pandemic, let's do this. Okay, great. Then maybe we could have thought about this more ahead of time. But uh, I, I think it's a cycle and it's the usual. This is the storm at sea. Can you stop it? No, I got to batten down the hatches, make sure I'm pointing in the right direction and do the best I can. No playbook to deal with housing supply issues. Also no previous playbook on how to deal with pandemics. And exactly. Yeah, we'll know for the next one. Right. So, Bill, always enjoy the conversation with you. Enlightening, eye-opening, great stuff. Really, really appreciate you taking the time to do this once again. Of course, Rich. Thanks so much, and thanks for all you're doing for the group. Thank you, Bill. And uh, to our listeners slash viewers, as always, we're here live uh, on Zoom every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern with the last week of Mortgage Today. And you can catch us on YouTube after the fact, post live or on podcasts where most of you listen. So until next Tuesday, have a great rest of the week and weekend, everyone. Take care. Bye, Bill. See you. Thanks again.